for our next speaker, Martin Newell. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here. And I'd like to start by thanking the IEEE and all the people who organized this meeting, and especially Dave Evans and Ivan Sutherland for having such an impact on so many people's lives, not least of all mine. Um, yes. So before I came to Utah, how did this all turn up this way? Um, I was working at a place called the Computer Aided Design Centre um, in Cambridge, England, and the point of this place was to help British industry in the areas of mechanical and civil engineering. And uh, we never set out or never had a formal program for making shaded images. We just did it because we wanted it to be able to show engineers what it was they were designing. So it was a need-driven thing, not an intellectual pursuit. And so uh, I had this PDP-9 um, with a display on it, and we modified that to enable it to draw 64 shades of gray, and on that we produced pictures like these. Um, this is just a sample of some of the engineering work that we were doing at that time. This is in about 1960. No, 1970, probably. Um, and just a couple of interesting pictures there. The top left, you can see one of the first images of a transparent object. Um, the bottom right, there's a very early image of an uh, automobile in stereo. And um, that year, we produced the company's Christmas card, which might be one of the first uses of 3D computer graphics in publishing. I don't know. Um, anyway, um, how, how come I wound up in Utah? Well, I only got this story straightened out just yesterday. Um, <laughs> and um, memory, you know. Uh, what I put on this slide was that Robin Forrest introduced me to Ivan. It turns out that's not true. Um, it was actually uh, Henri. Well, Dave Evans heard about the work that we were doing, and Henri was just leaving. Utah to go back home, and Dave suggested to him that he called off in Cambridge to see what we were all about. And I do remember Henri coming to visit. Um, and apparently Henri gave us a, a good report back to Dave. Um, so I wrote to Ivan and said, hey, you know, I hear you're doing some interesting things. And for me, shaded images had become a pursuit in its own right, notwithstanding its roots. And um, Robin came into it in that he wrote me a very nice reference to Dave to say, yes, hire this guy. So I met Ivan in a restaurant in London in the summer of 72. I remember we, we both turned up holding our portfolios of shaded images. And um, that must have been the biggest and most varied collection of shaded images on the planet at that time, I think. Um, anyway. We moved to Utah at the end of 72. Uh, we planned to stay for two years and go home, and um, we're still here. Um, we like this place. So thank you, Ori. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Ivan. Activities at Utah. Um, I started as a research assistant. I didn't come as a, as a PhD candidate at all. Uh, and. Um, while I was there, I, I project managed the uh, university's end of the building of the first uh, random access frame store at ENS, which we had installed, and also a hardware matrix multiplier for the computer system that drove the head-mounted display and the uh, Watkins box, the renderer, scanline renderer. Um, <clears throat> and so I collaborated with uh, Jim Clark and later Henry Fuchs on, on, on these projects and got to know them much better. And then Dave suggested I maybe I should enroll in the PhD program. Um, so I said, sure, that sounds good. 
Uh, so I, I, my thesis involved making, trying to make more complex pictures than were currently possible. The, the standard way of making pictures at that time was that you would represent your scene as a huge pile of triangles and then render those triangles. And uh, that has the limitation that once you've filled the memory with triangles, you can't get anything more complex. So I replaced that representation with algorithmic representations of objects in which you would sort out the, rel the relationships between those objects um, and then only convert any one object into triangles at the time you need it to render it. And so this saved a huge amount of memory. And it turns out this is an application of object-oriented program, but I, I don't think the term had been coined then, and I didn't know of Alan Kay's work uh, at all. So there you go. And so I could produce some pictures, which are at that time much more complex than others could with the airplanes flying around, and the one on the right, which is very complex and extremely boring. But it, <laughs> it, it, it kind of made the point that I needed more procedural models in order to make this more interesting. And I'll come back to that. Um, at Utah, I wound up graduating and joining the faculty there, thanks to Dave Evans, uh, shepherding me through that process. Um, and I supervised uh, several graduate students, uh, including Jim Blinn, uh, but I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, at this time, Jim Clark had left Utah and was at UC Santa Cruz, and he asked me to join him in teaching a summer course at uh, UC Santa Cruz in the summer of 76. Uh, I had written a graphics library, um, the roots of which probably go back to Cambridge University, um, in uh, a package that was developed there when Robin was there called Gino. And um, anyway, I developed this graphics library and took it to UC Santa Cruz, and we used it in the course. And that was all very well. It was only last week, I, I'd often wondered about this, that Jim wrote an email saying that he took that graphics package and it what turned into GL in the 80s and then opened GL at SGI in the 90s. So, I feel good about that. All these years later. <laughs> Thank you. After Utah, um, well, one of the things I learned at Utah, is one of the important uh, results of being there was the contacts and relationships that you made. And that played out many times. And one of them was with Bob Sproul. Bob Sproul, I don't think, was ever at Utah formally, but he spent a lot of time there and had a lot of influence there. Uh, working with Ivan especially. And uh, Bob introduced me to William Newman, who had been at Utah, um, who was at Xerox Park. And long story short, I moved from, Zero from Utah to Xerox Park to work on office automation, of all things, um, which turned out, well, thank you, I wish first of all, thank you, Bob. Um, but that turned out not to be my uh, real interest, so I joined Lynn Conway's group in VLSI design. And uh, part of that was a project called MPC 79 in which we took designs, uh, LSI designs from all universities across the country, combined them together into a set of chips onto a wafer and got that fabbed, sliced, bonded, and back to the universities. And one of the people who participated in this was Jim Clark, uh, who was now at Stanford. And so I worked with Jim on his initial um, prototype geometry engine, um, which he had on the process. And uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, John Warnock, uh, as, I, as he has said here, joined um, um, Park uh, in somewhere around, when would that have been? I don't know, I can't remember. Um, but I did collaborate with John on, on several projects. One of has been s talked about already was JAM, which was a second step in a progression from the design system to JAM to Interpress to PostScript to PDF. So I feel good about that one too. Um, meanwhile, uh, Jim and I started talking about starting a graphics company. And we spent a lot of time working together. And uh, this character, John Doerr from Hamburg and Quist, introduced us to a company in Chicago called CadLink, which was a CAD company. 
but was setting out to build their own workstations and it just seems that Jim's ideas for a rendering engine were just perfect to go with that for high-end design work. And <clears throat> cut a long story short, uh, ultimately I joined CadLink and Jim went and started SGI. Ed, you were talking about making mistakes. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, it wasn't necessarily a mistake. I could go, I could talk about that. Uh, but the main thing Jim did for me was to get me out of this large corporation and being a conservative Brit, you know, jumping into a startup was unthinkable. And uh, he got me out of there and the security that into a startup, just not necessarily the right one. Um, okay, I'm going to need to accelerate a bit here. Um, so after uh, Utah, oh yeah, another mistake. Um, John and Chuck came to visit and said, hey, uh, we're thinking of leaving Park and starting a company. Will you join us? So um, I'm kind of busy right now. This <laughs> that was um, Adobe Systems. Um, anyway, 15 years later, I went back to John and two startups later and said, hey, John, is the office still open? And he, he, he graciously said yes. Um, and I spent 12 of the most rewarding years of my career, so thank you, John. Um, back to the teapot. Um, so if I remember for anything at Utah, it's the teapot, so I'm going to talk about that some more. Uh, let's go through these quickly. The story I, of the teapot I related uh, earlier, so I won't go through that again, uh, except to say that's right, and and uh, do, 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 do. did that, yes, there's the picture, there's a, a picture, and there's one of the pictures out of my thesis that came out of this with all the tea set. Um, there's a picture I've got, though, that I only found last week, um, and that, this, I was sitting at this table having tea with my wife, Sandra, and uh, that's the table. <laughs> <laughs> and... <laughs> And no, that's not my wife sitting there. That's, that's my brother Dick who would come to visit. And if you look carefully at the left-hand side of the table is the original Utah teapot, still then in use for having tea. Um, anyway, that could have been the end of the story, but Jim Blinn came to Utah. And um, I was privileged to be his thesis supervisor although I think I learned more from him than he did from me, but never mind. Um, Jim chose the teapot as a test object for his experiments in rendering and texturing and bump mapping, and for my part, um, and I think Jim confirmed this, uh, seeing his techniques for how the mapping was done, I had the idea that, well, you could do the same thing for reflections, uh, you know, by seeing where a ray of light from the camera would bounce and where it hit the environment, so you need an environment map. So Jim went off and implemented that, and it, and it kind of worked. And this resulted in this paper, Texture and Reflection in Computer-Generated Images, with these many pictures of the teapot. And the teapot went viral. And <laughs> this was before going viral was even a thing. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, since then, countless images of the teapot have been made. I won't reproduce all of them, including the invitation to this, uh, to this program today, which is very gratifying indeed. And it's appeared in several movies. It was in Toy Story. Thank you, Ed. Um, and it's still being used today. Um, just um, last month, somebody in England called up and said, hey, there's this BBC TV trivia quiz show called Only Connect. And one of the questions in it was, um, what have these four things got in common? And one of them was Newell's teapot. Yeah. So I have achieved trivia status. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Anyway, bigger achievements. Um, since 2018, a Utah teapot has been awarded, I understand, to the inductees to the ACM SIGGRAPH Academy, and they, they get it on a nice plinth like this. <laughs> Um, but uh, going full circle, uh, some of the derivatives of the teapot that I like most are the ones where it's come back into the real world. And I've got a couple of examples of that. Um, and, you, and partly this is a result of 3D printing technology, and you can download teapots and print them at home and all that. Uh, but here's one that I think is really nice. This company, <laughs> Unfold Design, in Antwerp, uh, 
made this beautiful uh, ceramic teapot uh, out of molds 3D printed from this coarsely faceted computer model. <laughs> so here's the computer getting its own back on the real world by <laughs> producing a real world teapot with facets on it. And I think that's lovely. Um, another one I just learned about was um, in the fall of 2021, 18 months ago, um, Dublin in Ireland decided they wanted to commission a bunch of statues to beautify the city and all that. So they got Alan Butler, an artist, to produce these things. And he came up with this 10 foot tall teapot in a Smithfield Square in, in Dublin. And it was just bizarre. And I, that, that lady on the right is um, the mayoress of Dublin at the unveiling ceremony. And, but I must say, my favorite manifestation of the teapot back in the real world has got to be Pixar's walking teapot. So these things are given away by the thousands, I believe. Do you still give them away, Ed? I believe so. Um, I don't even have a full collection because well, they give them all away when they make them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's like that. I'd rather try to keep every single one, but I go back and say, yeah, I'm missing one. Well, we don't have any. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Ed was saying that, yes, they're still doing this, he thinks, and, and even Ed does not have a full collection. What, has it been going on, 20 years or something? Uh, or 15? More. Or more, more. All right. And Ed doesn't have a full collection. So, yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, uh, Ed, and uh, Dylan Sisson, I think, was responsible for yeah. turning that. Yeah. Uh, so the teapot, again, why? Coming back to my title of my talk. Well, the teapot has, been a, has become an icon for computer graphics. It's become an icon for CS department at Utah. Um, and the original teapot is in the Computer History Museum uh, in Mountain View. But uh, the, and there are only a few copies of the original teapot that are signed. And I thought it's about time the University of Utah had one. So if I could call on uh, Dean Brown and Mary Hall, uh, to come up here. It is my honor to present you with this signed copy, signed by Jim and me, um, of the Utah Teapot. Oh my gosh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Martin. We will have an appropriate place in our new building to highlight this teapot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.